Okay, so we're now thinking about this question of um, what are we actually doing when we classify subjects and objects? And that kind of gets to this question, this bigger question of what is and what are we talking about when we talk about subject? Right, so Columbry points out subject is an important notion used frequently both in the descriptions of individual languages and in stating cross linguistic generalizations. However, it turns out that in a wide range of cases, agreement as to what a subject is, is lacking. Um, and he gives an example of a kind of classic ergative case, in the, uh, which here is this Chukchi example, right? That if you have I came, where I uh, is used as an intransitive here, it has the absolutive case. And then in I saw the, where I is used as a transitive subject, it has the different ergative case marking. Uh, and it's actually, in this case, the second person pronoun the, which gets the um, absolutive marking, right? So that this is the classic uh, kind of ergative construction where you have an intransitive subject, which actually gets marked the same as the transitive object instead of vice versa, right? So just again, to define the kind of differences between nominative and ergative languages. In a nominative language, the transitive subject, which I'm calling A, and the intransitive subject I'm calling S, pattern together, whereas O will get marked differently. Whereas in an ergative language, it's the A, right? The transitive subject, which gets marked on its own. And then you've got S and O, which will kind of pattern together morphologically. And in some cases, syntactically also. Right? So defining subject across languages is not straightforward. Um, but right, diverse approaches typically agree that languages have some abstract representation of subject. So if you dive into the literature on what people actually have uh, written about and thinking about what subjects are, um, there's been this huge diversity of approaches. Uh, I'll kind of briefly and not fully summarize that here, but there's kind of the structural opinion um, that you know maybe subject is some specific structural position in a tree. Um, and then there's been a lot of work thinking about ergative languages, looking at this kind of split between um, what it means to be a semantic subject as opposed to a syntactic subject, right? So Dixon writes a universal category of subject can be defined as the set AS and is valid only for the level of deep structure, right? So this is that's taking a kind of hard semantic approach. Manning talks about the grammatical subject versus the argument structure subject. Aldridge talks about the divide between the ergative and absolutive roles in languages. Um, so, right, basically approaches which think of kind of two different kinds of subject, grammatical function subject and argument structure subject, right? Argument structure subject, meaning agents and patients, and that's distinct from grammatical function. And so this kind of account says, well, ergative languages are ones in which those come apart uh, and which grammatical function subject um, does not have the same alignment as argument structure subject. Uh, and then there have been cases for a kind of more multi-factor notion of subjecthood. So Keenan talks about subjects of certain sentences will be more subject-like than subjects of others. Clumry talks about um, the prototype of subject represents the intersection of agent and topic. This definition is multi-factor and stated in terms of prototypes. And Tallinn talks about a subject being uh, characterized as the most agentive verbal argument. So when we trained an Averso classifier across languages, um, what was it actually learning? Uh, and so to try to get at that question, we can look across languages and ask, um, can we look at a system that makes effective use of grammatical subject like multilingual BERT and ask what kind of representation of subjecthood it might have? So the kind of three uh, experiments I'll quickly go through here in this final part of the talk is first training a multilingual BERT subject object classifier, just like we did before, but this time testing it on held out intransitive sentences. Right, so in all of this training we've done so far, there have been no intransitive sentences included in the training set. And so we can basically ask the zero shot, how will this classifier handle these intransitive sentences? Right, and it's not entirely obvious what it will do, um, nor is it entirely obvious right, what it should do, right? So if it's going based on something more like semantic role, um, you might expect that it's going to classify intransitive subjects uh, as agents, 
But if it's in ergative languages, of which we have a couple, at least one ergative language, which is Basque, and then a couple um, split ergative languages in Hindi and Urdu, we might expect to do something different, right? So this is kind of the question, what about intransitive subjects? Right, which remember, they, in some cases, in nominative languages will pattern with the transitive subjects and ergative languages with the objects. So again, it's classifying just as before, except we have this held out set, which is all the intransitives. And we're gonna ask, does the intransitive get classified with the A's or with the O's? Right, and here are some results. So again, just as before, the brown line are things which are actually transitive subjects. The blue line are things which are actually transitive objects. Right, those were seen in training. This is the test set. Um, so again, we get good separation. But the interesting thing to look at is what happens with this green line here, which are the intransitive subjects. So we actually see some variation uh, based on the alignment, which is interesting, right? So for um, this is actually ordered by how close the intransitive subject S falls to the transitive subject line. And so what you see is that for languages like um, down here in the bottom row, which includes English, Indonesian, Spanish, and Slovenian, the intransitive subject line uh, get classified pretty much the same way that transitive subjects do. But for our ergative language, Basque and Hindi and Urdu, which have ergativity in some of their verbal paradigms, um, in those cases, the intransitive subject is does not pattern fully with the object, um, but it kind of falls in a much more intermediate space. So um, we get successful AO classification, right? Nice separation between the brown and blue lines. S is mostly classified as A, um, although it's consistently, even in nominative languages, it kind of falls less subject E than the A's. Um, but in mixed subject languages, it seems significantly closer to O. So we might ask, why does S not look more like O? Uh, so if this were purely classifying based on the ergative alignment, you might expect the green line actually falls closer to where the blue line is, right? It doesn't, it's actually like very much intermediate. Uh, so one reason for that could be that ergative, like even in ergative languages, you have some synchrony in the forms, right? So if you look here, this is Basque, um, the ergative singular and the absolutive plural get the same form. So there's some synchrony, um, right? Um, it's also possible that it's been written about that these languages, right, in our sample, are not fully syntactically ergative, right? So they're morphologically ergative. They have the case marking of ergative languages, um, but syntactically, they don't necessarily um, show all the uh, ergative features, right? Meaning that things like um, for relative relativizing, um, they might the yeah, the, and the rel if there's there's tests like relative clause hierarchy. That suggests it might not be quite syntactically ergative. Um, and then this, like this kind of possibility two, which is kind of um, <laughs> related to possibility one, is that grammatical properties generally associated with nominative subjects tend to be divided between ergatives, right? So the idea that if an ergative language is ergative, um, it's kind of got properties of both systems, right? So if we have this idea that there's argument structure and grammatical um, argument subject, argument role subject, and grammatical role subject. In ergative languages, they come apart, whereas in nominative languages, they're aligned. So we might expect it to be the case that ergatives are kind of intermediate. And then possibility three is that there's just a nominative accusative bias um, in general in Ember, right? Because most languages in the sample are nominative accusative, that that's kind of bleeding in here um, to these languages. So the classifier works, but there's this interesting difference. And to explore that more fully, what we're going to do is we're going to try transferring across languages. So in this case, we're going to train our classifier, right, the same AO classifier we had before, but instead of testing on sentences in the same language, we're just going to zero shot 
do the same kind of classification of A, S, and O, uh, but in transferring across languages. Right, so here are a couple uh, examples of how that works, right? So we've got here, we've got source languages, which are Basque, French, and Japanese, which means the language that we train on. And then destination languages are Basque, French, and Japanese, the languages that we test on. And so if you look here, if we train on Basque, test on Basque, this is the same plot I showed before, where you've got this, the green line intermediate. Um, but if you train on Basque and then test on French, um, performance overall goes down a bit, although we still get pretty good um, AO separation. <clears throat> but what you find is that relative to when you train on French, train on French, test on French, you see something that looks more like the ergative alignment, right? It falls much more intermediate. To put that another way, um, a couple of results here. One, the transfer performance is actually really pretty good for most language pairs. So if you look, um, accuracy typically falls above 75%, right? So each dot here is the performance on a destination language for the source language shown on the x-axis. And the red dot is the kind of same source destination pair. Um, so interestingly, right, it's not the case that the red dot falls much higher than the black dots, right? The same language accuracy is not actually an outlier for any language, um, which is pretty interesting, right? It seems like whatever this is that this classifier is learning transfers pretty well um, across languages. But what's cool is that uh, the morphosyntactic alignment also seems to transfer. So when you train on an ergative source and then test what happens to intransitive subjects in other languages, they're more likely to be labeled as O. Right, so this uh, plot shows the proportion of intransitive subjects labeled A for each destination language. And when is the case that you have Basque, Hindi, or Urdu, you're less likely to call something an A uh, than a non-ergative language, right? So the source language seems to matter um, in this kind of transfer. Put another way, uh, we here um, derive a measurement to basically Looking at the log odds ratio, how close is S? So how close is the green line to A based on the source language? And split it by Hindi, Urdu, and Basque, these kind of ergative um, or split ergative languages, nominative accusative case languages and uncased languages. And what you see is that how close the green line is, so how close is S to A, uh, it's closer in nominative accusative and uncased languages than it is in the absolutive ergative, ergative absolutive languages, right? Um, there are a couple outliers here. Again, Latin is one of them. Um, uh, and also Finnish and Estonian and the nominative accusative languages. It seems like those are kind of heavily inflected. It's not, not totally um, clear what's going on there, although there's some interesting potential speculation. So to summarize that, um, we get this transfer of subject object classifier across languages with fairly high accuracy, so greater than 80% at layer 10. So it's got some kind of cross-linguistic representation of subject that seems to transfer. Um, but again, we come back to this question of what does that representation actually look like and what features is it actually picking up on? So in the continuous embedding space, um, we can use this idea that the classifier actually gives us a graded definition of subjecthood, right? And that kind of lets us computationally look at this idea that subjects of certain sentences will be more subject-like than the subjects of others. And we already saw that for intransitive versus transitive subjects, the answer already seems to be yes, right? So intransitive seem to kind of fall somewhere in between objects transitive objects and subjects in kind of at a sample classification. And so what we want to do now is use the classifier as a tool for telling us which subjects are most subject-like. So basically, given this training set, can we identify features which might predict subjecthood in classification? So the features we're going to look at, we already looked at one of them. It was transitivity, right? But we can also look at animacy, passives and case marking. 
Uh, and ideas I won't, I won't show now here, but might be interesting at some point is discourse status. Um, kind of what Adina was getting at about topicality, right? Because top, which plays a big role in what makes subjects subjecty. So to first look at animacy. So what I'm gonna do now is look at the probability that the classifier says a particular token is an agent based on whether it's animate or inanimate. And that's what we show here. So on the left are uh, the probability of being an agent in each of these languages for animates versus inanimates. And what you see is that animate nouns uh, tend, right, in both cases, you get accurate classification as subjects, but the animate nouns tend to get assigned higher probabilities of being subject. And objects, Likewise, inanimate objects get assigned higher probabilities of being inanimate objects. And then, as we saw before, intransitive subjects fall somewhere in between, but again, the same pattern. So the more animate something is, the more likely it is to be called a subject by the classifier. Right? Passives are interesting because they're also less agentive, right? So just as agents that are just as inanimates are typically less agentive, um, passive subjects are typically less agentive. And again, uh, that's kind of what we see, right? We see this gradient classification where things which are O's are classified less as subjects. Here's A's. Um, S, like we saw somewhere in between. And then passives kind of show this widespread, right? So passive subjects uh, are particularly hard for the model to classify. Um, and then one more, which is case marking. Right, so nominative cases are which are typically more agentive are more likely to be classified as A. So here is the model probability of being classified as an agent in Finnish. And what you see is that the probability of being called an agent is higher, so about 90% for nominatives and lower for partitives, which are also um, a case sometimes assigned to agents, yeah, sometimes for subjects in Finnish. Um, so to summarize that, we basically get this continuous embedding space, and this classifier lets us get this graded definition of what actually constitutes a subject, right? So you can imagine training a linear model to see what set of features, I'm not going to show that now, uh, but it's something we're hoping to do at some point, what set of features might best predict grammatical subject of Ember, and how much can be explained by that, right? So if subjecthood were all feature-based, um, if we find enough features, we might be able to kind of explain something about how this model is actually doing this classification and thereby say something about what uh, we're actually doing when we train the subject object classifier. What is it actually picking up on? So, um, to conclude, we can say, um, the first experiment, right, looking at humans and machines, uh, we can conclude that word types themselves carry a lot of information about what's a subject already, right? But it seems like contextual embeddings um, are useful for representing something about kind of surprising subjects and objects, right? So the hammer stole the electrician case. But there's a kind of puzzle of, well, what are these contextual embeddings actually representing about subjects and objects? And to get at that, we use this classifier to get at a kind of graded multi-factor notion of subject, right? And so consistent with these kind of multi-factor functionalist theories of subjecthood, which say subjects are intersections of that which is agentive, that which is topical, um, that which is kind of old in discourse, it seems like the case that we get this kind of gradient uh, notion of subjecthood in which it seems like what the model is classifying as subject is this kind of bag of constellation of features associated with subjecthood, such that the thing which is most agentive, um, most agentive, most nominative, most animate, is the one that's most likely to get marked as subject, and that you've got this kind of intermediate space um, for intransitives, inanimates, and things which kind of fall in between. Um, so let's see, I want to, um, well, yeah, why don't we, 
pause. Oh, yeah, I'll just kind of briefly share some concluding thoughts. I don't want to run too long here. All right, so if BERT has this cross linguistic representation subject hood, what does it look like? Does it learn representations for each language on their own terms or something more general? Does it look like any of these proposed definitions? Right. Um, so it's seemingly multi factor, but not purely semantic. And I think there's more work needed to kind of get to a kind of fuller understanding of what this classification task is doing. Um, but I hope to have shown that it's, uh, I think, an interesting and useful tool for uh, exploring these questions. Um, so with that, I'll say thanks and take uh, any questions and